Hi everybody, welcome to the PEZL webinar, Play in Green Spaces. My name is Jenny Gibson and I'm today's chair. We've got some great speakers for you today, but first of all, I thought I would just introduce the format we're in. The format is um, Zoom webinar. So it might be a bit different than the Zoom experience you're used to. I'm sure that um, lots of you are spending lots and lots of time on Zoom. But Zoom webinar is kind of designed to facilitate talks. And so your um, camera and your microphone are going to be automatically muted. But if you do want to make a contribution, and we very much hope that will be questions and engagement later, we'd really invite you to um, drop your comments and questions in the chat. So just before we get started, I want to talk you through um, a little bit about Pedal and why we're here. So um, PEDL is the Centre for Research in Play in Education, Development and Learning. We're based at the University of Cambridge in the Faculty of Education. And you can see a great picture of us here um, on a day out um, back when that was possible. We were having an adventure visiting the Welcome Collection in London. We have lots of different projects in um, the PEDL Centre. We have um, a number of um, PIs, PhD students, um, research assistants and staff, and we're all um, clustered around um, the same goal of understanding the role of play in children's lives, um, whether that's their academic development, um, their social and emotional development, their um, fundamental human rights to play. We've got somebody who's investigating. So, our three aims are providing a world-class research environment. So we're based in the Faculty of Education. So um, we're very much centered on doing rigorous academic research that has a bearing on education and on child development more broadly. We're interested in building capacity in play research. So we're really emphasizing training of students. So we have um, a strong PhD program. We have master students joining our projects, even undergraduate students can get involved. And beyond that, we do workshops with practitioners and with the general public. So um, part of the reason we're hosting the event today is to engage with a wider audience in the conversations around play and its role in children's lives. And we're really also keen to influence policy and practice. And I know that many of our speakers today are really passionate about that angle on play research. If you'd like to stay in contact with us, there's a QR code here that you could scan to join our mailing list, or you can find us on um, pedalhub.org.uk, or you can look at the University of Cambridge Faculty of Education website to find out more. So um, I want to introduce our fantastic lineup of speakers today. I'll introduce them now and then we'll do the talks kind of one after the other. They're going to be short 10 minute talks to just give you a flavour of what each speaker brings in terms of perspectives on children's play in green spaces. And this was a topic we're really interested in, in the light of the restrictions that we're all experiencing at the moment and really how much we've come to appreciate um, the importance of green space in all our lives. So first up, we've got Ellen Beata Sandsetter from Creedmoor University in Norway. And she's going to give us a kind of international take on um, children's play in outdoor and green spaces. Um, then we've got Kath Prisk from um, Community Interest Company or Social Enterprise Outdoor People. You might also recognise her work from Outdoor Classroom Day. Then we've got um, Helena Craig, who's the chair of Black to Nature, um, which is a charity set up to ensure that everyone has access, particularly children from minority backgrounds or um, black children in the UK. And then finally, um, much closer to home for those of us in Cambridge, we've got Sally, Yu, um, Sally Lee from the um, Cambridge University Botanic Garden Education and Learning Team. So we're going right from that international perspective down to um, the very local. So I hope that you will um, really enjoy these series of talks. After we've had each person's 10 minute talk, we'll open the floor to questions which you can write in the chat and then I will um, direct them to the right um, person. So without further ado, let me hand over to Ellen. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. I 
would have loved to be in Cambridge. That, that's one of my favorite cities, <laughs> being an academic. But I have to sit here in Trondheim in Norway and, um, uh, and I can't even see you, but uh, that's how uh, uh, things are right now in the whole world. I was invited to say something, like Jenny said, about uh, play outdoors, play in green spaces. And since I come from Nor uh, Norway, I will give you a little presentation from the Norwegian perspective. Uh, to start with, I wanted to show you a quite uh, confusing table. Uh, but I, what I want you to look at is this is uh, parents uh, reported barriers for children's uh, play outside or outdoor play uh, in five European countries. This is from a, a EU project that was that I was um, uh, doing together with colleagues in these countries, and you can see that one of the most uh, common uh, reasons or barriers for letting children play outdoors is lack of spaces. You can see it's fair of getting injured, media alerts, uh, stranger danger, uh, your own concern anxiety or parents' concern and, and anxiety. And uh, these are quite common um, factors when looking at barriers for children's outdoor play. But if you look at the, the green and the red circles, you can see that the Norwegian parents are quite uh, or much lower in, in their percentage on these barriers. They have fewer uh, fears about letting children out, uh, play outdoors, while especially Greece and Portugal are quite high up there. So the question uh, from the, this table would be why is it so? And that is has something to do with the Norwegian perspective of outdoor play. So the Norwegian culture is has a very strong root uh, connected to what we call free lift sleep. Uh, it is directly translated out uh, or free air uh, life. And it's more than just outdoor activities or, or outdoor play. It's more like a philosophy and it's a way of living. Uh, and the reason for Friluz Liv being so strong in Norway is probably because we have a very strong outdoor culture and our, our national hero, heroes, such as, uh, as uh, Ruala Amundsen, Fritjof Nansen and Thor Heyerdahl, who were great explorers, have uh, had a very high influence on the emphasis on outdoor life in Norway. Even today, our heroes are outdoor people. So the basic idea of a Norwegian childhood uh, is the notion of letting children stay out in nature. They should be uh, experienced roughening. Uh, they get a lot of motor development, fresh air, good health, and they would develop care for environment. And also to, they will learn about nature. Another very important factor is that we have something called the law of common access. And that means that all Norwegian have the right to wander around in, in, the, um, in the wilderness, in the forest, by the seashore, even though it's privately owned. It's a citizen right in Norway. So uh, I can go there with my family. I could go there with uh, the school class or the kindergarten, whatever. We can use even pri privately owned land. Uh, so, for because of all this, Frilus Liv uh, is very uh, common in Norwegian family life. So it's a natural part of uh, of how we, how we live with our family. So almost all uh, Norwegian families go on Sunday hikes. Sundogs too. It is a concept. Uh, many of the Norwegian people have cabins in the mountains or by the seashore or even both. Uh, so we spend a lot of time in nature going to our cabins. Uh, we do a lot of hikes in the forest, mountains and seashores every weekend and sometimes even during afternoons and, and evenings. And we have a strong hunting and fishing and berry gathering culture. Uh, when it comes to playgrounds, uh, they are open and easily accessible for all the, uh, all the citizens. So even in schools and childcare centers, they are not locked up. In the afternoon, uh, I could go with my family and spend time on a playground that is a school's playground or, or a childcare center's playground. 
we spend a lot of holidays uh, doing Fidelusli, uh, and many we have many official organizations that facilitate Fidelusli for Norwegian uh, people. Uh, like the Norwegian Trekking Association, uh, an associ association called Norwegian Friluftsliv, uh, and also throughout the counties, there are local uh, organizations. And also, local councils have a strong emphasis on facilitating Friluftsliv in their community and giving people access to green spaces. So you go hiking, uh, this is me and my kids when they were younger and my mother. So you go hiking the whole generation together on a Sunday maybe. Uh, or this is uh, grandparents on the hike with their grandchildren without the parents. Uh, fishing with the children from a young age. This is in the mountains. We have a lot of snow. So we go skiing and children start maybe like two, three years old. They start uh, practicing to, to ski like this little guy. So this also means that in the Norwegian child care centers or what we call Barnehage, that's the universal child care for all children in Norway from uh, around one year until they're six and start schools. Uh, there's a it's, it's, uh, there's quite a strong emphasis on being outdoors. Um, so most of the, uh, the Barnehage spend more than 30% of the time outdoors in winter uh, when it's quite cold and more than 70% the rest of the year. Uh, it's common for uh, preschools to have at least one day hiking to the forest or the seashore each day. And the teacher education and the preschool teacher education has a strong emphasis on uh, outdoor play and learning. So the teacher's competence is high. They're skilled outdoor pedagogues. So this is a preschool uh, hiking. This is also a preschool hiking in winter. This is uh, preschool uh, girls climbing. So when this is, this, uh, these are reasons for why we score so low on the barriers. But of course, there are in factors influencing children's opportunity for outdoor play. And as you, as you saw in the table in the beginning, uh, the, um, the, the worry about the risk, uh, about, worry about risk and injuries is quite strong and also stranger danger. danger. So children are now looked upon as more vulnerable than a few decades ago. Media is more aggressive on, you know, big headlighting the catastrophic, uh, catastrophic news. Uh, parents' attitudes and practices are changing and also teachers' attitudes and practices are changing. But one of my research areas, areas and I will not go into detail on this because I, the time is, is strict, but one of my research, special research areas are, uh, is the, the benefits of outdoor, outdoor risky play. And we have a lot of uh, implications or, and sometimes evidence that uh, risky play is a good risk taking in play and outdoor play is very good for children's development in terms of psychological uh, skills, uh, uh, physical motor competence, spatial orientation skills, better social skills, and we have studies that show overall uh, positive health effects. And one of the things that I find most important is that it also develops risk, risk management among uh, children. So it actually is, in my view, the best injury prevention. And I just want to, to, um, to uh, also mention that uh, the there are studies that show that nature is one of the best places for children to explore risk in a good way and in a way that is adapted to their own courage and their own skills. And um, yeah, I won't say anything more about that. I don't know how much time I've been <laughs> using. Uh, so this is just the take home for you. It's from a project that did uh, or um, was a part of in Canada a few years ago. And our slogan was the biggest risk is keeping kids indoors. They are developing better if you take them outdoors and they're also developing risk managing skills if you take them outdoors. 
So this is from a Norwegian Barnehage, the picture. And enjoy and thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. That was really, really super interesting. I know there'll be lots of people wanting to dig into this um, further in the questions. Okay, next up is Kath Frisk. Hi, everybody. Um, and I'm Kath Prisk, as, as Jenny said. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Um, slightly nervous following Ellen Sansetter. I've been reading her work for many, many years. And uh, that was fantastic and beautifully sets the scene about why it's not just important to really think about the, I mean, we can think about uh, the kind of planet we leave our children, but what kind of children we leave our planet, to think about um, the culture that is around about children's play. So when I was thinking about what to talk about in this play in green spaces, you know, it kept coming up, like how do we increase opportunities for children to play outside? How do we increase the number of people using our parks? How do we increase the chances that every child has to go outside. And I thought, let's turn this on its head. How can we make it as culturally important in the UK, in England, to make outdoor play as culturally important as reading to your child at night, as having healthy, sustaining food, as having good access to clean water, having safe housing, children growing up in a self, safe place. How can we make sure that we have zero on that um, list of, of, you know, where can children play outside? You know, 76% of the Greek population finding that worrying compared to zero in Norway. That's a cultural difference about what is perceived as a place to play. Um, Tim Gill put on Twitter this week a beautiful statement that said, um, Oh, I, can't, I can't do it perfectly, but it was, you, why are we corralling up our children? Um, that's like saying that all the animals are disappearing, so we should put them all in zoos, right? So um, I've purposely got here a few different logos. So I'm Kath Brisk, I'm from Outdoor People. It's my social enterprise on a mission to make it easy to get everybody outdoors. Um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about Outdoor Classroom Day about the outdoor play and learning program and about London National Park City Schools. Um, I want to see a world where, this is my brand new puppy, uh, this is Jim Hawkins. And if I didn't make sure that I took him outside every day, three or four times a day as, as a little tiny puppy, um, then I would be a very bad dog parent. But Zaina here, um, if she is stuck inside all day, every day, if that happens to her, nobody's going to say that her parents are neglecting her. So outdoor people, I just wanted to just touch on this, why we do what we do. In London is now world's first national park city, but in case you didn't know from the monitoring engagement of the natural environment stats, 24% of London's children get to a park less than once a month, get to a green space less than once a month. So I set up Outdoor People in 2014 to look at different ways to shift behaviour around children, families, the communities they live in and the schools they attend. We build community around the idea that going outdoors every day is just as important as a good night's sleep. Um, and that community is really important, that social proof, that's what changes things. Um, I'm just going to touch on what stops children going outdoors, just to build on what, what Ellen has said, um, very much echoing what she said, but I've got a couple of new things, um, and touch on four key culture change interventions that I know shift priorities for families getting outside every day. Our goal is every child, every day, outdoors. So what stops children getting outside? Traffic. In the UK, why does it stop us more than it does in Germany? Um, clothing, I did a, a very rough and ready uh, survey with a lot of mums about four years ago, five years ago, and 45% uh, didn't own a raincoat. If mum doesn't own a raincoat, she's not gonna stand outside in the rain. Um, it's not for people like me. You know, we've heard a lot about, and we're gonna hear more today about that. Um, 
what the neighbours might say. When I was uh, working at Play England, we did a, a big survey about what stops you going outside. And number four, consistently, was I'm worried about what other people might think about me. Um, it's too expensive. It's cold. It's damp. It's frightening. Um, I put this picture up specifically because these young women are 9, 11 and 12. What did they do as soon as they got to the wood? They went off and played cops and robbers and jumped in a load of mud. They did not want to sit around talking about boys and hair and other things that people might expect them to think, to talk about. They wanted to play. Uh, out, what stops outdoor play at school? I'm quite horrified that in the UK, um, poor behaviour in class stops kids getting outdoors all the time. Um, if you're having a really bad day and really grumpy and having a stupid argument with your husband and you're told, no, you can't go outside, no, you can't take a break, you have to sit there and keep working, it doesn't exactly make you feel better. Uh, weather. We live in a rainy climate. Why is it weather stops people going outside? What's interesting is what people actually mean by weather. There were schools in Canada that said, you know, weather stops us going outside if the hailstones are bigger than the children's heads. Um, I really want to, oh, this has gone forward one. I want to mention this, the Health and Safety Executive in 2012 ratified this statement on children's play and leisure, promoting a balanced approach. Note that it says when planning for provi and providing play opportunities, not if, when. The goal is not to eliminate risk, but to weigh up the risks and benefits. So everything that Alan said, that's what children need. Right, our jobs as play professionals, as schools professionals, as community professionals, is to make sure they get it. Um, play is great. There's HSE, the Health and Safety Executive in England, says that play is great for children's well-being, that no child will learn about risk if they're wrapped in cotton wool. So what is it that we can change? What can we do to make sure every child gets this? So these are four culture change interventions. Outdoor classroom day is on May 20th this year. If you don't know about it, please look it up now, share it with everybody, tell everybody about it. It is a great gateway to getting institutions outside. Um, it started in 2011. Since then, we've reached over 10 million children um, in 177 countries. Um, Last year in our survey of schools, 63% of the schools who took part said they've increased playtime since getting involved. Even more said they increased outdoor learning. Um, even more said they talked to parents about how important it is to go outside. So get involved in Outdoor Classroom Day, and especially if you know a school that doesn't go outside, get them to have a go, at least one class. And then the next year, maybe it's the whole year group. The next year, it's the whole school. Beyond that, um, we facilitate, so I facilitate working with a wonderful advisory board of lots of organisations that support schools to get outside. I like learning through landscapes and trees for cities and the garden classroom in Islington, a whole range of organisations. We, we, we're trying to build a London National Park City Schools Network to complement the London National Park. Um, the MINI data shows, it says it, 7% of children reported being taken to a green space by their school. I mean, that's clearly not quite right. I don't believe that only 7% of children were taken to a green space by their school, school, but perception is everything here. So can the schools network support all the London schools to connect with the green spaces around them on their own sites and beyond? to get outside every day. That could be gardening, that could be canoeing, it could be climbing, it could be going for a walk, it could be playing outside, it could be taking maths outside, even doing PE. Um, we want to see 100% of children enjoying London's green space. There's not a single child, a single school in London that isn't within 15, 20 minutes walk of somewhere green. Most of them are five to 10 minutes. What can we do to get them outside? So the National Park City, we're campaigning on bigger issues. We're connecting schools, investing in different aspects of getting outdoors. Um, we're here to get more London, London kids outdoors and asking schools very much, how can we help? Um, we're very small so far. We definitely need some funding if anybody knows anybody. But like, look us up, get involved. Opal. The first time I went to an Opal school in 2008, I walked onto a playground on a damp Tuesday lunchtime. 
and the sound. You know the stressful sound of a damp Tuesday lunchtime, children screech, screeching and slightly stressed. Well, there was none of that. There was 400 children aged between three and 11 on this playground, all playing together in different age groups, girls really physically active, building dens, all busy, busy, busy. There was a little seven-year-old, fell over, skinned his knee, little bit of blood, brushed it off, got off, went on playing. The head teacher said, um, since I've introduced Opal, I've got no incidents of bullying being reported. I've got a very few, uh, much reduced accident rates. I've got more time after lunchtime every single day. This is a tried and tested award-winning program that supports schools to transform their playtime so children get the risk, the filth, the, the dirt that they need. Sorry, Jenny, right. It's a lovely quote there. Outdoor People's Outdoor Families Programme. We take children on, we take children on wild walks for them to take their families on. We introduce them to the wild spaces of Hackney and get them to become adventurers. We help families who are very disadvantaged to, to go on a camping trip, to their first camping trip, to learn how to camp, teach them the skills, help them shift their own behaviour. This is the kind of like the, 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 the cycle of what we do that really shifts families. This is, um, uh, um, uh, this is one of our mums who's one of our poster, poster mums who very much was one of those people who said, yeah, I take my kids outside for a treat. And then she started working with us and doing lots of other things for her boys. And now they make sure they get outside every day. I saw this on Twitter the other day. It just made me... Oh, it just brought tears to my eyes. When this is all ends, I'll be kind, I'll be free. What are we all going to do to help those children be kind, be free, be outdoors? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's like you want to get out there and play right now. Those photos are really inviting. Uh, okay, so thank you. Next up is Helena Cray from Black to Nature. So... I'm Helena Craig from Black to Nature, and I live just um, south of uh, Bristol in the Chew Valley. So um, basically, I'm um, of Bangladeshi heritage, and I grew up in inner city Bristol. And um, in my late twenties, I got into bird watching through my husband. And um, I suppose this story is ours, but um, my youngest daughter my oldest daughter was really into birds and um in this photograph you can see her in the purple there and then uh we sort of had a much younger daughter so Maya Rose uh grew up bird watching and um and what she says is that having an older sister having someone who looked like her being outside in nature um made a, a huge difference in terms of her carrying on wanting to go out into nature and into green spaces and being the only person who looked like her, just the three of us. And um, she, um, we, we sort of carried on bird watching and stuff. And, and uh, when she was 13 years old, she decided to organise a nature camp, as you do. And um, uh, all the people who signed up to this nature camp were um, white boys from rural homes. And um, she just suddenly realized that, you know, what, what am I doing? You know, why is this? And, um, and then went away and talked to loads of people in the inner city and managed to get some um, people to come to the camp from the inner city. And, um, and that was all great. We thought it was great. And actually, um, it was more difficult than, than we um, thought. And we were all cursing her because it was just like beginning of, the, of a, a long weekend. And we thought it was going to be like awful. But actually, she managed to engage every single um, person who came. And she was 13. And these boys were sort of 16, 17. And, um, but she made nature relevant. And by doing that, uh, they were able to connect 
you know, with nature, they were able to engage with them, they were made, able to feel that it was something that was um, some, for them. So um, a short time after that, some, um, you know, this is uh, just some friends who, who uh, were at university, the university club and had gone up. I think this was on Dartmoor, but um, it just made her realise really, because we weren't really thinking about it at that time, because you're so used to having an environment as it is. So we were just really used to being in a white space and that was just how it was. And um, I think this image really sums up what she was talking about, which is that we don't have to engage with nature. We don't have to engage with the outdoors in the same way. And actually culturally, um, people have different ways of connecting with nature and it's no less important. This is one of um, our Camp Avalon camps. And um, I think that what we realized back, this is back in 2015, was that you can engage anyone with nature. And um, back then there was a lot of, um, within the environmental sector anyway, there was a lot of talk of how some people just aren't interested in nature. They're not in interested in the environment. And um, it's their fault that they don't come out, basically. And, um, you know, and there were so many actual conferences that I'd been to and that Maya had been to where she was speaking and people were sort of coming up and saying, but do you know what? Um, I just think teenagers aren't interested in going outside. They're just interested in being on their phones and chatting to their mates on social media. And, um, you know, and it's not our fault that we can't, engage them um, and it's not about fault but it is about making things not just relevant but um, understanding uh, what they are interested in and um, trying to engage them with that rather than um, trying to sell them what you're interested in so a very short example of that was um one of these conferences very early on there was somebody who'd organized a event for 12 to 14 year olds um on identifying fungi and i know the fungi are really beautiful but i couldn't even persuade my rose to go on that and and basically there was not a single teenager signed up for that um event and it was just maybe the way it was sold but it was you know the average 14 15 year old apart from a certain type of mushroom aren't really that interested in you know or they think they're not going to be interested in um fungi so uh one of the things that we uh learned at the first camp was that actually teenagers whether they're minority ethnic or not are individuals and they all like different things. And so you can't just have an event with, um, you know, you could have an event with just one thing, but it's unlikely that you're gonna get lots of people to sign up because some people think, oh yeah, that sounds interesting, whilst others will, um, you know, will, will not seem to be interested. And um, anyone who works with teenagers will know that um, often they'll enjoy things that they don't think they, they're gonna enjoy. And primary children are much easier. They just engage with everything. But um, so um, very early on, Myra has organised a um, filmmaking uh, workshop in an inner city park in Bristol. And um, we had, I think she had about 25 people come to that camp. And she sold it as a... Um, filmmaking on a YouTube, how to YouTube workshop, which is why she had so many young people come along. But they came and they were filming in an outdoor space and, um, and just were really positive about it. And actually um, 15 of the 25 then signed up to uh, one of our camps for that summer. Right, so this is um, just our first um, primary school uh, camp. And um, so we're not very far from Bristol and um, the primary children um, are, are very vocal about what they like. So they arrive and they're really, really excited because it's, they've seen their first cow and their first sheep, 
you know, from the minibus. And if they see a pony during a camp, that's just it. That's their weekend made. But there's a lot of poverty. Um, and, um, you know, we ensure provide lots of treats like fish and chips or ice creams and stuff because um, the children just um, there isn't the money for that at home. Um, OK, so there's a bit of um, research from UCL came out back in 2016, I think, at the same time that we started the camps, which basically found that um, minority ethnic people often have negative expectations about visiting a place, whether it's going to the countryside or a museum or anything like that, and, and will feel very apprehensive or not go. So if there are staff, even sort of low-level staff, who um, show negative behaviour, whether it's meant to be racist or not, um, that can reinforce those feelings and stop people from coming back. And we've had lots of experience of racism towards our children, particularly um, so openly towards the teenagers and uh, maybe not quite so openly with the um, primary. Um, yeah, so I think um, we, we really looked at some uh, mean stats, but just the two um, headline for... Um, you know, that I want to highlight, which is that 74% 70, of non-minority ethnic um, children uh, vis visited um, a natural space weekly. And that drops by 10% for those who are um, in areas of deprivation. But for minority ethnic, it's like 20% less, 56%. So there's, on top of the socioeconomic reasons, there's a significant drop because of um, culture and ethnicity. So in 2016, Maya Rose organised a conference. Um, so um, Bill Oddie came and talked about mental health and we had 90 people there, um, half from the conservation sector and half from that were community leaders. And actually what was interesting was that the two groups had never met, had never spoken. And so there was a lot of new Inform sort of information that came out of that conference. Okay, so um, there were lots of barriers highlighted, which um, are things that you might, well, things like general society racism, feelings of uh, non-inclusion, poverty, uh, class, inner city deprivation, but also things like um, the, the way that um, engaging with nature is a very mono-ethnic white British way. And so it doesn't really allow for um, people of other cultures in terms of how they engage with nature and then also perceptions that the countryside's white elitist um, and that their children will be negatively stereotyped and that's something that we've seen on our camps actually right so we sort of um one of the things that came up was um fear dislike of dogs and um this is actually a really big um issue and um but what was interesting was a lot of the nature reserves actually have a no dogs or dogs on leads policy. So it's perfect for um, people who've got issues with dogs. Um, so there's lots of things like fear of outside influences. Um, the, 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 um, there's some solutions as well, but I'm going to share the slides. But the, um, the last thing that I will um, say is that most of our primary children are not allowed to go on school camp because their parents are concerned that the schools aren't going to meet their religious cultural needs in terms of food and anything else and they just don't feel that they're going to be looked after or that something might happen and so the way that we um persuade parents is that we have some who come on the primary camps to see what it's like and then tell everybody it's great and um, but we also go and meet with the parents and we explain to them how what precautions we take so that children can't be taken out of the tents at night or you know I don't know disappear or what you know their what their concerns are because for them going away alone so um that's I won't go through the rest of the slides but um you know that's all I want to say can we just go to the last slide actually um one of the things that is on the slides is the need for um organizations to change because the environmental sector is only 0.6% minority ethnic and there's a huge amount of work to be done to make any changes on that. 
So um, these slides are actually my roses that I just stole and her details are there. And um, she's actually coming to Cambridge in October. So hopefully um, groups that are here will make the most of um, her time in Cambridge in terms of um, talks and anything else. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Helena. You must be so proud of Maya Rose and we will definitely look out for her. <laughs> what, what's she going to be studying? Human Social Political Science oh, at fantastic. St John's. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Congratulations Thank you. to her. Okay, so we've now got our final speaker, um, Dr. Sally Lee from the University of Cambridge Botanic Garden. Okay, so I'm Sally Lee. I'm from Cambridge University Botanic Garden, and I'm going to be telling you about all the playful activities we do at the garden. So my job there as a learning officer is to make sure that families feel really welcome when they come into the garden and also make sure we've got lots of fun things going on. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the garden, um, some things about the challenges we have, and then go through all the fun things we do and finally insist that you all come and visit, visit us. This is an aerial view showing the Botanic Garden. So the Botanic Garden is this green area down the bottom and it's right in the city centre of Cambridge. It's um, a 40 acre site. And I know you can't really tell from an aerial photograph like this, but it's full of amazing landscapes. Uh, there's a glass house range, so you can explore tropical rainforests, deserts, and it's a great place for children to come and play and explore. We've also, of course, got amazing plant species. We've got 8,000 in total. We've got plants from every continent. We've got the moonflower that's on this picture here. We've got um, carnivorous plants, gigantic trees. We've got plants that are tiny and camouflage themselves as stones. And that's really the main aim of the Botanic Garden is to look after all these plants and to make them available for researchers. So people who are researching things like food security, uh, dis discovering new compounds, looking at conservation. And, and that's what we do. But we have another role as well, and that's to make the botanic garden and all the plants available, av available for people. Um, and this has been an aim of the botanic garden ever since it opened. So it opened in the Victorian era, and I managed to dig up these old rules of the botanic garden, um, which do say, they do sound pretty strange, strip by today's standards, but they say all respectably dressed strangers on condition of giving their name and address, if required, are allowed into the garden, which I know does seem like super strict, but in the era when these rules were put together, it was a really great thing for the Botanic Garden to be open and to be welcoming people who weren't part of the university into, into the garden. So since then, of course, we've continued to welcome people in and get more and more welcoming, not quite so strict. Um, this is a bit of a funny photo. This is from 1969, and this is when the first prams, the first perambulators were allowed in the Botanic Garden, which does seem kind of quite recent to me and like inconceivable that they weren't allowed in, but, but there we are. Um, and then that brings me on to where we are today when we have 330,000 visitors, 40,000 children visitors every year. We have school visits going on. We've got big garden events. We've got trails and things with families, community groups, so much happening. So we're uh, very welcoming. We've got loads happening. And though the Botanic Garden has always been a welcoming place for visitors, I don't think it was ever a mad that we have quite so many visitors and certainly I'm pretty sure it was never imagined that it would be a place where children would play um so it does we do have a few complications because of that so they're kind of summed up to me in this picture so this is our limestone rock garden but what you're looking at will really depend on who you are so if you're um a Cambridge horticulturalist, you will say, oh, it's the, the limestone rock garden full of interesting plants from all around the world. But of course, if you're a child who's coming to the Botanic Garden for the first time, it just looks like the most amazing natural climbing area. But unfortunately, it's where some of our most delicate and precious plants grow. So we don't, we don't especially want it to be used as a climbing 
climbing area. So although we are welcoming and we do want people to come and play because we know play is so important, uh, we have a few challenges. So we try and overcome these challenges and I think we do it uh, fairly well. So the different things we do, one thing is we try and communicate to our visitors. Although the Botanic Garden to many people will just look like a really amazing park, it is different. We have this commitment to the 8,000 plants we look after. Um, we also try to make sure we've got lots of other places where they can play. So we've got some people here making a grass maze and that takes the pressure off places which are more delicate like the limestone rock garden. And then we just make sure we've got lots and lots of fun activities going on. So I'm just gonna run through some of the things we do. So we have trails at the garden. So you can come and you can pick up a trail from the ticket office and you can pick up a little backpack as well. And the trail will sort of set you off on an adventure in the garden. And there's usually some sort of active element. So you're not just going and looking at a tree and reading some information. There will always be a doing element. So you might be collecting fallen material and decorating a hedgehog. You might be visiting some trees with googly eyes and making magic wands or you might be stamping a passport as you go around the plants of the world. And I think it's really important to have that active element because it allows us to cater to a wider age range of children because there'll be some who just like the stamping and some children who are a bit older who are able to, to read and enjoy the little funny facts we've got about the plants. Um, so as I mentioned before, we try to make sure we have got lots of fun places in the garden. So we've got the grass maze, which is great to run around. We've got the stepping stones, which are extremely popular with all children. We've got a place called the school's garden, which is somewhere where local children can come and grow vegetables. But it's also a place where families are coming and they're just hanging out and playing with chalks. We've got a dinosaur, um, a little area to play, uh, we've got a throne to sit on, and most popular of all, we've got some uh, toy lawn mowers and toy wheelbarrows. And what we hope is by having these things, it's kind of an invitation for people to, to play with them, and also that people will start to feel like the Botanic Garden is really a place for them, it's really a place where they, they're welcome. We've got another area called the Dell, which is quite quite new, it's behind the scented garden, if you know, know the Botanic Garden. And it's an area where children can run around and be a bit more free. Um, we started having big events up there as well. And we've got some magnifiers and also some fairies moved in and made a wing repair shop, which was really exciting. Um, in normal times, we also run lots of drop-in activities. So these will take place the first Saturday of every month and we get messy, we do crafts, we plant things, um, and just have lots of fun really. And we also run bookable activities, and this helps us get different age groups of children into the garden, so that maybe the really young children or the children who are a little bit older, if we do special activities for them, it allows us to really cater for their needs and make sure that they're coming in and enjoying the space as well. Then that's, that's the end of my talk. Apart from to say, please come to the Botanic Garden. Um, if you're a family, you might be interested to know we've got a, a new activity starting tomorrow called the Easter Bingo. So we're basically turning the whole garden into a game of bingo. You have to go around and spot the signs of spring. And then if, when you get a line, like traditional bingo, you get to come to us and claim an Easter prize. And if you're, if you're a teacher or you work in a school, then please bring your class. We're open. Um, we're open and taking bookings now. So thank you. That's the end of my talk. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, I will definitely be there. <laughs> it looks like so much fun. And I'd like to invite our speakers now to turn your cameras back on. We've got um, about five minutes left to um, talk to each other or to answer some questions that have come through in the chat. So fantastic. I have been looking at the questions and comments that have come through in the chat and we've had lots of really nice engagement there. So a theme that is coming through is around parental anxiety and how we manage um, 
risk. And I think that's a theme that's come through a number of the different talks as well. So I was wondering if um, if I, any of the panellists would like to reflect on that. How can we um, manage this perception, you know, because it's come through in a few talks that there's, there's, there's risks to children going outside, but actually maybe the really big risk is that they're, they're actually staying indoors and, and not getting out there. So um, I'm opening the floor to anyone to respond to that point. Let's take Helena and then Kath. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I was just going to say um, that for inner city minority ethnic parents, there are sort of additional concerns for them. And that rather than talking about injury and all that kind of stuff, what they talk about is um, the fact that if they let their teenagers go to the local park with their friends, that um, one, they might be uh, seen as troublemakers by the police. And, you know, if they seem to be alone and um, also the risk of um, getting involved in drug running or that kind of thing. So even if it's not getting fully involved in gangs, so I think that, um, you know, parents have got sort of genuine concerns about, you know, the kids going out, older children going out. Yeah, yeah. so, um, Kath, did you want to come in on that? Oh, yeah, I mean, this is a, a long and ongoing debate. I mean, there is a real thing about if you see a couple of boys kicking a tin can around um, and they're white middle class ragamuffins and then or if they're white working class they'll be slightly feral if they're two black kids the same age then that's definitely going to get a lot more eyebrows raised um and if they're two girls everybody's a bit surprised and um you know there are lots of programs that change this around I mean this is why I wanted to ha focus on the culture change because if you get a lot more children playing outdoors, you know, if you look at what the Playing Out project does about getting whole streets out, if you go to areas where it's normal and common for kids to play outside, you know, the Blockers Flats I used to live in in Hackney, I was there for 20 years and we made our car park a play priority zone and put up signs saying play priority zone and made sure like this, like no, no there wasn't a no ball game sign, there was a ball game sign. And that because the social proof is there that everybody else wants your kids to be outside then people feel much more comfortable being outside and if they've been playing outside from six seven years old then well Maud on the corner is not going to get so nervous when they when she sees the 14 year old version of the seven year old kid that she's seen every year every every week playing outside when he's 14 and sitting there like pretending to smoke a cigarette she's not going to um call the police she's going to go outside and go wait what do you think you're doing I'm going to tell your mum and it's that I mean the, the difficulty is I mean I'm walking around the streets here and you're not seeing any kids at all they're all either corralled into their own gardens but 21% of London's families don't have a garden so where are they they're inside their flats we have to turn this around that they cannot be corralled inside. They should be outside. You know, if every school was requiring kids to walk to and from schools like they do. I mean, most of Norway, your kids walk to and from school, don't they, from the age of seven? Um, in Berlin, they're expected to do that. In most of Switzerland, parents are not allowed to take their parents, their kids to school. You walk your kids. The cool kids have to walk to and from school. So this is we have to turn this around. That's why, so the, the family wild walks that we support, the outdoor people started seven years ago. I think the, the difference is building social connection. You get a group of people who start walking together. They bring a friend along. They walk out a bit more. They see for themselves, those parents, how important outdoor play is to their children. And then they make it part of every day. Alan, do you wanna come in with the Norwegian perspective on this? Well, yeah, I totally agree with Kat. Uh, and also, I think, um, even though I'm, you know, um, I think children should be uh, left alone to play. Uh, but I think for parents, it's important to be together with their children and go out in the neighborhood or in the forest or green spaces, the nature, together with the children so that they can see 
uh, how well they manage it and they can get to know the child's competence because I think that would kind of lower the anxiety for, for what is going to happen. So I would say parents should not only eat dinner and watch television together with their children, they should go out there and play together with them so that they, they in the next step could draw back and take a step back and then let the children uh, go on alone without getting this anxious uh, or catastrophic feeling. But I also, uh, uh, there was one more thing I was going to say. What was that? Um, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, well, I, I'll come back to it. Yeah. No problem. I think that it's, it's so interesting that there are all these different um, perspectives and, and something that I think draws it all together is children are competent yeah. and capable. Oh, go ahead. I remember. <laughs> yeah. One, and I don't know about the UK situation, but I'm, guess, I'm guessing it's the same in, in the UK. Uh, what we have noticed with our students, which are, you know, from like 19 until 20 something years, um, is that when we're talking to them, like if some years ago, if we asked them, what are your greatest childhood play memories? It was always playing in nature. It's no longer the case. So the, one of the problems is that parents nowadays don't have the same reference frame as I did as a parent, uh, having all these great memories, playing outdoors alone, uh, managing and being pr proud of managing uh, my, myself in, in nature. Today's young parents don't necessarily have that uh, as their good memories. So, uh, yeah, I don't, it's not a solution, but uh, giving them some memories, even though they maybe are already be become parents, maybe could be a good thing and that's why it's so important that projects like sally you're running in the botanic garden you get parents and children it's not just bringing in groups of school children outside of the families you're really getting the families in there yeah we really want families to come and, and enjoy the space yeah so um, and we've just um well just today actually we started a new survey to try and evaluate how our families are getting on when they visit us, what we can be doing to, to better facilitate their visits and, and things like that. So if, if anybody listening is a regular visitor to the Botanic Garden and wants to, to fill in our survey, then please do. You can find it if you go to our Twitter account, find us on Twitter and then fill in our survey. That would be fabulous. Fantastic. We're getting so many nice comments um, just about how everyone wants to move to Norway. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but also um, around how important it is building up intergenerational transfer. So getting play with parents, play with grandparents involved and wider families together. Um, I think we're going to have to leave it there. It's been such a fantastic discussion, but I really don't want to extend everybody's Zoom day beyond their, their tolerance. And hopefully people can still find time for an evening walk and to get out, out there. But I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who's joined us today. We will be able to um, share the talks on YouTube so you can go back if there's points that you want to revisit. And definitely there's things that I want to go back and understand more about and I just want to say thank you to our fantastic panelists as well it's been such a privilege to chat to you all so thank you very much